When you meditate, try to be very conscious of holding a particular perception in mind. In this case, it's very simple, the perception of the breath. That's all you have to think about. As you sit here being sensitive to the body, be sensitive to it as breath. Just think. If you feel energy in the body, it's an aspect of breathing. Any flow as the breath comes in, the breath goes out. It's all breath. And looking at it as breath, be sensitive to how it feels. If you've ever had body work done, sometimes you'll notice as a muscle gets released, as tension gets released, something you took for granted all along, that that part had to be hard, had to be solid, had to be held. You suddenly realize it didn't have to be. It could be released, could be relaxed. You change your perception of it. And the same way with focusing on the breath. Think of everything you feel in the body as being related to breathing. Part of the breath energy. There's the breath energy coming in, going out, and then there's breath energy that's just there in the body, regardless of whether the breath is coming in, going out, or being still. It's just breath, breath, breath. Hold that perception in mind. And be sensitive to how the breathing feels. What kind of breathing feels best right now? And the best way to answer that question is to allow yourself to breathe in different ways for a while. Think long breathing and see what happens. Then you can think shorter breathing and see how that feels. Then decide which one you prefer. You can think deeper or more shallow, heavier, lighter. Then as you get more sensitive to the breathing in the body, think whole body. Try to be aware of the whole body, all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. From the top of the head down to the tips of the toes. You'll find that your awareness has a tendency to shrink, so be very careful to remind yourself each time you breathe in, whole body. Each time you breathe out, whole body. And try to notice what effect the breath has on your sensation of the body. Some kinds of breathing will feel good in the arms. Sometimes will be related to tension, say, in your shoulders, in your back, in your legs. So you've got a wide range here to be sensitive to. What ties it all together is that one perception of breath, breath, breath. And that's the recipe for meditation. You could also call it the recipe for jhana. The descriptions in the canon, when the Buddha talks about meditation, fall into two kinds. There are the how-to recipes, and then there's the description of what you get at the end of the how-to. It's like different kinds of writing on food. Some authors will give you the recipes. So you do this and you do that, and then you get the dish that you want. Now there are authors, for example, restaurant critics, like to talk about the finished product. And it's important that you not mistake the two kinds of writing. In other words, you can't use a restaurant review to figure out how to cook the dish that's being described. For instance, you hear about souffles, and the restaurant critic will say, well, this souffle wasn't very good because it was heavy. That souffle was better because it was light and airy. So you see the word airy. And so you go into the kitchen and you bring in your air compressor, and you try to pump air into the eggs. And what you get is a mess all over the walls. So you might try to reverse engineer a dish. You tasted something and you figure out what this must be based on what you know about the various foods that are available. And if you're a really good cook, you can reverse engineer it. But there are also some disasters. For 
for instance, in Thailand. Somebody in Thailand came to America and had a salad that had a mayonnaise dressing, went back to Thailand, decided to recreate it. They knew it was white, it was creamy. So they made a salad dressing based on condensed milk. And that became the standard salad dressing through Thailand, all through my early years there. Anywhere you went to a salad restaurant that had Western food and they had a salad, it would have a dressing based on condensed milk. So be careful when you meditate not to read the descriptions of the finished product as a recipe. In other words, you read about John and has directed thought and evaluation and pleasure and rapture and singleness of preoccupation, so you try to bring all those things together. You make them the object of your meditation. But that's not how you get the mind to settle down. You get the mind to settle down by very simple instructions. Be sensitive to when the breath is long, when it's short. Once the breath is comfortable, spread your awareness to fill the whole body. And then notice how the breathing has an impact on the way you experience the body, and try to calm that impact down so the breathing feels smooth and easy doesn't create tension as you breathe in. You're not holding on to tension as you breathe out. And the sense of holding the body here in the present moment gets lighter and lighter, just by noticing how the breath impacts the body. That's all you have to do. You don't have to think about directed thought or evaluation. You don't have to think about pleasure or rapture. Just think, being sensitive to the breath, be sensitive to the whole body, and then notice how the sense of the breath, as the Buddha said, fabricates as an impact on your sense of the body, and do what you can to calm it down. There's a story that Lumpur Put tells and when he was a young novice studying with a John Sao. And John Sao was a man of few words. He would say, meditate on the word Bhutto. People might ask him, what does Bhutto mean? And he said, don't ask. What's going to happen when I meditate on Buddha? Don't ask. Just repeat, repeat the word in your mind. And so you went back home and you tried it, and then you came back and you told him, okay, when I do this, these are the results I have. And then he would tell you, okay, those are heading in the right direction or they're heading in the wrong direction. And then he'd tell you how to go from where you'd been. In other words, he wasn't interested in having everything all explained beforehand. He was interested in giving you the recipe, not the restaurant review. And the Mahaput said as a young novice he would read in the books that Ajahn Singh had written. You know, Ajahn Singh tended to be more elaborate in his discussion. He'd say, establish mindfulness. And so he'd go and ask Ajahn Sao. Ajahn Singh says to establish mindfulness. Why don't you say establish mindfulness in your meditation instructions? And Ajahn Sao said, well, if you just start repeating the word Bhutto and keep it in mind, that's establishing mindfulness. You don't have to go into the long descriptions. I'm just telling you how to do it. And it's by focusing on the how-to that you get the best results. And John Fuang was a similar sort of teacher. He'd give you the basic instructions and send you off to meditate on your own. And if you had any speculative questions about the meditation, or you wanted to check what kind of jhana you were attaining, he wouldn't be interested. Just like, focus on the breath. Tell me what the breath feels like as you stay focused on it. And if it felt heavy or, or whatever, he would say, okay, if in that case, do it this way, or think of it that way. Sort of guide you along the path without giving you a lot of advanced notice about what was going to come up along the path. And you find that you start getting results without having to think about the books. Later on, as you started experiencing different things in the meditation, it was convenient to have those maps, to have those restaurant reviews, so you get a sense of where you were. So you could sort out the terrain in your own mind. But it was best to have some experience first before you got obsessed with the, the descriptions. Because otherwise you start squeezing things 
in line with your preconceived notions. And of course, what are your preconceived notions based on? They're based on ignorance. John Tong, who's now abbot at John Lee's monastery, gave the example one time of a person who has an unripe, <coughs> an unripe mango on his tree. And his friends tell him, we've got an unripe mango. It's green and it's hard. What you want is a ripe mango, which is soft and yellow. And so the guy goes and he paints the mango yellow and he squeezes it to make it soft. But he doesn't get a ripe mango. What he gets is a mess. You don't focus on the mango. You focus on the roots of the tree. You water them. You give them fertilizer. And the mango will take care of itself. That's where you learn an important lesson. That things happen according to causes. Get the causes right and the effects will have to come. At the same time, the Buddha's instructions get you developing, <coughs> developing both insight and tranquility as you practice. As you're aware of the whole body, it's hard to think about any past or future as you're spreading your awareness to fill the whole body. The more you inhabit the present moment, fully inhabit the body in the present moment in this way, the harder it is to go thinking about past and future. That helps with the tranquility. Then you start looking at how the breath has an effect on the body. You're learning to think in terms of fabrication here, which is the topic of insight. And then as you calm the fabrications down, that brings about more tranquility. The insight and the tranquility go together. With that, you're happy to think about the word tranquility, or having to think about the word insight, or get involved in all the many discussions that revolve around those two terms. You just look at how you experience the breath in the present moment, see it as a process of fabrication. And as you get more sensitive to what you're doing, you begin to see simply that perception of breath fabricates the way you experience things, fabricates the feelings of pleasure and ease or dis-ease that you feel. So you're learning to look at your present moment not simply as a given, but as something that you're participating in. And you have the power to participate in a more skillful way, something that gives rise to a greater sense of ease, lightness, fullness. Without you having to read the restaurant reviews and try to make it light or try to make it full. It just grows that way as you get more sensitive to how the breath feels, how you can calm down the impact of the breath on the body. That's where you learn to see the power of your perception by holding on to that perception of breath. It really does change the way you experience things. This is an important insight in and of itself. In the very beginning, it seems very unlikely. How could you hold on just to this one perception and have it make an impact? Not much, because we've all had perceptions in the past. They come and they go. But if you really hold on to it and are convinced this will make a difference, you find ultimately that it does. And you think about it in terms of everyday experience. Your perceptions really do Im have an impact on what you see. I suppose you saw a picture in the newspaper of a woman, say, in her 60s, looking very disgruntled. And suppose the caption on the, said that the victim of a bank scam. You look at her expression of being disgruntled and you sympathize with her. If the caption said, this was the mastermind behind a bank scam, you'd have a very different feeling about her, simply based on the perception. Well, the same principle applies to your body, applies to the present moment. The perception you hold in mind will have a huge impact on 
how you're going to experience things. So trust in the fact that holding on to this perception of breath, 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 as you breathe in, as you breathe out, whole body breath, as you breathe in, as you breathe out, calming the breath, as you breathe in, breathe out, it can take you to a sense of ease, a sense of well-being, a feeling that you can really settle down in the present moment and be very clear and alert about it. really can make a change in what you're experiencing. That's a very important lesson right there, that what you choose to focus on and how consistently you hang on to that focus can have a huge impact on what you're experiencing. Then you can learn how to take this lesson and apply it to other aspects of life. When you're sick, when you're bored when you're anxious. Whatever the situation outside, you realize, I may not be able to change the situation outside, but I can change my perception, so I don't have to suffer so much. And when I'm not adding excess suffering, it's making it lighter for other people as well. So a lot of lessons to learn here, just in those simple instructions, the Buddha's basic recipe for how to get the mind to settle down with clarity and a sense of well-being. So try not to clutter up your mind with a lot of restaurant reviews. Sometimes you read them and it sounds impossible. Can any mere mortal like us attain those states? Well, we can, but it's not by reading the descriptions and trying to create a recipe out of the descriptions. The recipe is in the basic breath meditation instructions. Again, it's like fixing a souffle. You mix the ingredients together, you see, ask yourself, how could this ever become light and airy? Well, it can if you do it right, and it is possible to attain strong states of concentration and to feel at home in them. But make sure that you're selective in what instructions you keep in mind, what instructions you leave for another time. This is one of the paradoxes of the Buddha's teachings. He says that the teachings are timeless, and they are. But at the same time, different teachings are useful for different times and situations. So make sure that you're focusing on the teaching that's right for here, right here, right now. And the results will come.